What is stuff? Sometimes the simplest questions are the most difficult to answer. Along with space, time and energy, the concept of matter is one of physics' greatest challenge. Throughout antiquity, the prevailing wisdom was that a combination of dirt, fire, water and air explained what matter was. And if the theory was correct, dividing anything into smaller and smaller part should eventually yield one of those four constituents. And in the 5th century BC, one man asked that question. An apple is a familiar, simple, visible, solid object, often used to represent ideas, concepts, or phenomena in physics. And so the Greek philosopher Lucipius wanted to know, how many times could you cut an apple and divide it in smaller part before it can no longer be called an apple? He shared his thoughts with Democritus, who coined the word indivisible or atomus in Greek. This idea lingered in scientists and philosophers' mind for two millennia without much attention. Until the 18th century, phlogistics explained the roles of fire as a driving force behind matter transformation. Chemistry was not a science until the work of Antoine Lavoisier, Joseph Priestley, Humphrey Davy, and many others who challenged that idea. Their work led to the discovery of many elements and understanding of chemical reactions. The concept of element as indivisible by chemical mean is a direct consequence of the work and research of the scientists of that time. This was a very important step towards understanding the atom and matter. During the same time, electricity sparked a renewed interest and revived the concept of matter and its constituent. In 1808, after the work of Alessandro Volta, John Dalton introduced the concept of atom in chemistry for the first time. The work of Michael Faraday, George Ohm, Charles Coulomb, Andre Marie Ampere, Ben Franklin, and so many others cannot be overlooked, but all contributed to the 1897 discovery of the electron by J.J. Thomson. These grains of electrical stuff must be coming from matter itself. But since matter is generally neutral, and with the mass, charge, and size of the electron now established, it became rapidly clear that the atom must also contain a positive charge far heavier than the negative electron. By the early 20th century, matter consisted of atom listed on the periodic table arranged by Dmitry Mendeleev in various degrees of complexity, themselves made of negative seeds randomly distributed in a positive cake of unknown shape. In 1896, Henry Beckwell, Pierre and Mary Curie, another fire new source of energy that no chemical reaction or physical state could alter. This radioactivity was coming from the atom itself, but what part? In 1909, Ernest Rutherford submitted a gold foil, much like this one, to an intense alpha particle bombardment. His source was far more active than mine, but the results are the same. Thanks to the work of Charles Wilson, particles like the alpha decay of radium were known to be heavy and to carry two electrical charge opposite that of the electron. In a vacuum, most alpha particle can pass right through the thin gold foil. But some were deflected and few even recoil back to the source. Obviously, something massive and dense must be present to deflect the alpha particle traveling at about 6% the speed of light. This experiment strongly hints at a core where most of the atom mass is concentrated. The physics of the nucleus is a fascinating field of investigation. Unfortunately for the amateur, this field of science usually requires expensive equipment, complicated math, large amount of energy, and legal drama. Back when no regulation existed, science was able to move forward and progress were made. The 1927 Solvay Conference is one of the best gathering of pioneers on the subject. Madame Curie, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Max Planck, Paul Dirac, Werner Eisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, Hendrik Lorentz, and many other familiar names established the groundwork for what we know today as nuclear and quantum physics. One thing was made clear from this gathering, more power to break the atom is needed to understand what matter and what the nucleus of atoms really are. 
To understand how something works, you'll have to take it apart. There's no screws to remove on the atom, so the best you can do is smash it to see what's inside. To do that, you'll need a particle accelerator. A charged particle always accelerate towards the position with the lower potential energy. This means the energy of any given charged particle in an electrical field is given by the equation E equal QV, where E is the energy in joules, Q the particle charge in coulomb, and V the potential difference in volts. The unit of joules is too big for a single particle, so electrovolts were assigned instead. It's agreed that a single charged particle under a single volt of potential difference would acquire one electrovolt. Most chemical reaction released a few electrovolts of energy at best. A chemical bond can easily be broken, but nuclear reaction released thousands to millions of times more energy. So to break an atom would require at least a few hundred thousand electrovolts. To get nuclear reaction, you can brute force your way into the nucleus with millions of volts of electricity. In fact, this is the way early electrostatic accelerator worked. The Westinghouse Atom Smasher near Forest Hill, Pennsylvania could achieve 5 million volt DC. It was used to discover photofission. It was also instrumental to many key energy measurements for future experiment, at least until the synchrotron and cyclotron replaced it in the 40s. Although in 1932, the Cockroft Walton High Voltage Multiplier was able to split lithium into alpha particle using proton accelerated under 400,000 volts. Now for the purpose of this video, the Linear Particle Accelerator or Drift Tube Linac was invented in 1928 by Wolf Ridro. It can generate higher energy in a smaller space, smaller than the electrostatic Van de Graaff Atom Smasher. It can achieve mega electrovolts of energy and easily trigger nuclear reaction and is still used today for particle injection in larger colliders and on a smaller scale in medical device. So naturally, I wanted to build one. For this project, I use a high vacuum stainless steel tube with a source of ion on one side and a detector on the other. The acceleration would be done in the center where a series of copper tubing act as electrodes. Generating millions of volts DC is not easily done and even less manageable. Most of the electronic in my garage will not survive a 10,000 volt pulse, believe me, I tried. I choose to accelerate alpha particle because helium is safe to handle in large quantity around high voltages. An alpha particle can trigger a few interesting reactions. The advantage is to be able to control the flow and intensity of the incoming alpha nuclide far greater and safer than a radioactive source of similar flux. For example, a coulomb per second is defined as one ampere and correspond to 6.2 times central power of 18 elementary charges. So a tiny current of one milliampere is one one thousand of coulomb per second and would be equal to 1.24 times 10 to the power of 15 charges per second. This is the same flux in every direction coming from a 33,000 Curie source of radium-226. A naked source like this in your hands would be lethal in 12 seconds. Two hours from two meters away, it would have to be kept behind 40 centimeters of lead to be approachable. Just like an X-ray machine, turning a concentrated flow of particle on and off in a controlled direction is obviously a better and safer option, but is more difficult to do than simply generating x-rays. For my setup, the ion source consists of a simple hot filament made from tungsten wire. Adjusting this knob here allows me to control the current and intensity of the ion released. It sits in the chamber with a small hole on one side and high voltage positive bias on the other. So if I inject a small amount of helium gas with this high vacuum valve, helium becomes ionized, loses its electron, and is repaired by the positive bias to be pushed down the main body of the accelerator. This is a four feet long stainless steel tube with six inches ultra high vacuum fittings. Inside, the electrodes are made of copper tubing electrically connected to each other with uh, custom made plexiglass spacers. My turbo molecular pump is exactly the size of this opening. I used a cold cathode vacuum gauge for my initial test, but because it contains a magnet that will interfere with charged particle traveling nearby, I replaced it with this uh, hot cathode one. The five-way chamber 
at the end has a viewport, a secondary valve to flush the whole system with helium and return to atmospheric pressure if needed. On the top here, I have a high voltage electrode connected to one of the copper tubing from earlier. For now, my residual gas analyzer allows me to monitor the level of vacuum contamination and check for leaks. A quick check, detected none. For the accelerating system, I used the original Widrow design, using AC and changing the polarity a few thousand times per second between accelerating electrodes can eventually push a charged particle to higher and higher speed, but this requires alternating at high voltage in the low HF band. As mentioned earlier, charged particles only accelerate in the gap between copper tubings, since the electric field remains constant while the alpha particles are traveling inside the tubes. Since helium nuclides are supposed to go faster and faster, they'll spend less and less time going through each electrode, so the tubes are longer and longer. The acceleration should be with n the number of gaps, e the energy gained, q the charge in coulomb, and v the potential difference in volt. So naturally, higher voltage and the larger number of gaps would be best for a maximum bang. Because the electric field must oscillate to carry the charged particle from tube to tube and eventually from one end to the other, an AC voltage is needed, but this only accelerates particle in burst, so a square wave generator is preferable over a sine wave. I've looked all over the eBay and the internet for ideas on how to find such a high voltage regulated frequency square wave signal generator. I looked for a tutorial on how to possibly build it myself. And I also reached out to other YouTubers far more qualified and get absolutely zero response. But when I think of a high voltage at high frequency, a simple device comes to mind. The Tesla coil. So I built one. I measured the maximum gaps of my Tesla coil to be about 30 centimeters. So given the humidity, I can estimate the voltage to be around 300,000 volts. The oscilloscope showed the pulse of each discharge and resonance of the coil every 2.5 to 1 microseconds or so. But this is a rather messy signal centered around 400 kilohertz, with a lot of interference as you can see on the spectrum analyzer. And if uh, you wonder what this noise sounds like on an SDR radio, Turns out the computer didn't like it, probably because of the electric field which is almost 2000 watt per meter square, 217 milligauss and just over a watt per meter. This is a neat project but I won't be able to use it here. Instead I found this. This is an ENI 1600 watt RF power generator. It can be tuned from 10 to 105 kilohertz with an output voltage of about 300 volt for a maximum power of 2000 watt. This device was successfully used as a plasma generator by the previous owner, but after a 2300 miles journey, oh, fuck. it wasn't. A bit of cleaning and some hard to find parts later, I was able to get it to turn on safely. All right. But not generate any power yet. I might use it to power another Tesla coil, but for now, I use this ENI power generator instead. This is the HPG2 power supply, able to generate from 125 to 375 kilohertz, up to 200 watt. It works fine, and I was able to get my drift tube to resonate at 250 kilohertz. Now, detecting and measuring the energy of incoming charged particle in the high vacuum and high electric field is a difficult task. I thought about using the Faraday cup from the mass spectrometer as a detector, but uh, that proved to be a problem since the inner working of the quadrupole are continuously changing the path of incoming particles. I could disable it, but I would rather keep my instrument in working order for now. I could use one of these alpha scintillation screens for a very analog detection, but I'd like to be able to measure my progress quantitatively, even if I never reach a single MEV. I did find this electrometer and I was uh, just about to set it up when a catastrophic pressure failure destroyed some of my equipment. Fortunately, I was not directly in the line of fire when the glass ruptured, but my neck was targeted. Not so lucky was the glass viewport, the hot cathode gauge, the mass spectrometer quadrupole, and the drift tube. Most can be replaced, but the amount of time, work, and effort cannot be recovered. So I have to delay this uh, project for now and I will return with results. This uh, frustrating event 
could have been worse. I could have hurt a real person or my friendly visitor here, or even damaged my turbo pump. Thankfully, the grid prevented any intrusion. I really wanted to advance this project since I could not find any serious attempt on YouTube. Aside from this setback, I'm fairly close to get results or at least some interesting events. At least the part two will not have any boring historical background to explain what I'm doing and why. I could have waited to release this video, but I wanted some uh, feedback. So if you have any suggestions, I always read your comments. For now, I hope to see you again on the next one. Constructive criticism is always welcome. Thank you for watching. Damn it!